Welcome to episode number 10 of the Obrey Hours. I'm your host, John McTemus. Today we're going back to Strong's H127 Adame. We're going to get through a lot of the important things about it. And we're going to look at a lot of those problematic passages that it's in. Uh, however... <clears throat> this is this is the at least the second time that I'm recording this because what we probably won't get to is what I tried to cover in the first place which is massive going into it because there's so many well there's so many terms and simply the wording of it that makes it very difficult, very complicated. It's the granddaddy of all of these problematic passages and uses of Adam. And that's found in Genesis 2, 5 through 9. Genesis 2, 5 through 9 is, uh, it's the effect of what we're told was the uh, ta'uladut of everything that had happened before that, the seven days of creation. And we have that before we get our, <clears throat> excuse me, our geographic description of the garden. So what I didn't do the first time that I brought this up a few episodes ago was go through with you and show you in uh, a very objective manner why we have every right and cause to look at the word Adam A and think that it being translated as ground or soil has no good basis that it has uh, far more weight and evidence if we look at it as um, a generalized term and being mostly relayed to Adam. And Adam, it, clearly by context, is a kind. The entire uh, Bible is to the descendants of this particular Adam and that particular Adam we see in Genesis 2. What I keep finding more and more as I look in Genesis and as I see all of the the words that have been misappropriated and mistranslated and oftentimes when you see these in later books I guess, I guess you could start as early as Exodus and go all the way to Malachi. Sometimes it doesn't really add up why these words would be so poorly translated. Uh, unless, part of the point of changing a lot of the, the terminology was because the, the origins, the story of of the origins of our origins and everyone's origins and who everybody is and what indeed happened in that most important book Genesis that text and the way that we understand those words had to be changed and in order to keep up appearances a lot of other words had to be changed too and I think this is part of the reason that gives rise to why we can look at any given Strong's entry, and it's the same word, but it's translated a dozen or more times, and, and, and oftentimes those words that, it, that it's translated as, those different words and uses of it, are not synonyms. I mean, even, even the way that... Um, let's say a word like Aretz is, which is based on the way that 
Adam uh, is currently translated, Eretz would be its uh, a synonym. But even looking at Eretz, it's translated a few different ways that aren't necessarily synonymous. Okay, the land and the world, or the land and earth, those aren't synonyms. And the various ways that Adam at H127 is rendered, those aren't necessarily synonyms. So the reason that I see, as far as the effects of, of words being used later on in the scriptures, that they don't add up, and it's, it's kind of a head-scratcher, why did they do this? I think what we'll always find when we get to those points where the words, they're just so out of whack. We're going to find points, typically, in the scripture where very important thoughts or ideas are being relayed. And so, so things had to be changed. We, we find uh, multiple passages, just for instance in Genesis, where so much about those passages have been changed. That, that oftentimes, when they're working with a passage that they wanted to change dramatically, they literally have to change a lot of words in there. And when you're working from a point of view where you have to, you have to cross-reference a lot of, of roots and, um, if you don't have a lot of roots to compare their usage. And when you consider how many words are, are badly translated, let me put it this way. You could, in, I, I've shown examples of how you could just change, you could take a few, uh, maybe a few nouns or a few verbs in a book and just change those. And you could change the entire meaning. But when you think about it, as long as you have essentially, essentially, and not always, but essentially the grammar and the syntax intact, essentially, which only requires you keeping a consistency to a few parts, there's not much you couldn't change. Now, there are some words that are nearly impossible for, for them to have been changed. But a whole heck of a lot of them are just wide open to it. Which is why it's so important, as I see it, to get to the bottom of what these glyphs are representing and how they, they work. Uh, I've gone as far as to... <laughs> to start investigating various forms of sign language, which, when you go back far enough, they, they call it uh, gest gesture, I'm sorry, gesture language, which was actually a bit different a couple of centuries ago than what most of us see when we see like ASL, though ASL has a lot of the same characteristics as older gesture language. It's quite similar. But anyways, this is, this is why. These are the reasons why. Because there, there's... Oh, there's just so much. If you look in... Um, when I'm doing these tables, these root tables, I will come across a half dozen words in a, in a row that they're the same word. They're literally represented in the text the exact same way. But there will be five or six entries. And sometimes in those five or six entries, there will be dozens, dozens of different ways that that same word is translated or rendered. And they can be very different. So... No matter what else, something wrong is happening in the text. With the way that words are changed. And we can see it in, if we just apply some objective logic. 
the same thing no matter no matter if i were right about my theories concerning uh obri being a glyphic language though it has all the characteristics and the more we study language the more even the materials that are available for the most part being controlled opposition materials even the very old materials still you got to look who's been in charge of publishing for centuries now. And they've been working really hard at destroying a lot of books for, for a really long time. But even the controlled opposition out there revealed to us that the older languages are languages of symbols, images, pictures. <sighs> So that being the case, we can't we can't look at any of these words or any of these glyphs as being coincidental. Yeah. They they appear as they do in combination with other glyphs and in passages for a very good distinct reason and the idea of um homonyms and synonyms because it being a symbolic language just goes right out the window um, those sorts of features in a language really only work well if you have meaningless letters and not meaningful glyphs or pictographs so i'm going to show you some examples of how just adding that E ending virtually always unless they had to change that word um, every time I, I do tables and I find words with that E ending we're always talking about a, a softer more generalized form of the root we see that and that's been carried over to languages of today Western European languages of today, you can add that E ending, and it's more of a generalized uh, form of what the root was. So just know that finding these examples was not remotely difficult. I literally just went through my Strong's list and picked them out. It was easy as can be. So we'll start with uh, A-E-B-I-E-B which is H157, translated love. Then we have a e b and it's H160, also translated as love. We have bush, H954, translated shame, and boucher, H955, also translated shame. We have gedar, H1443, um, translated as wall, up, barrier, and gadar e. So every time I'm I'm telling you these, they're the, it's the exact same spelling just with the e at the end, and that's uh, h fourteen forty eight, and it's translated as hedge as folds. Um, sorry, I just hit something on my desk. Uh, there's gad, h seventeen o nine, translated fish, and gade, h seventeen ten, also translated fish. There's edar. H1926, translated glory and majesty, and Edare, H1927, translated beauty, honor. There's Ulad, H2056, translated child, Ulade, H3205, born or bear, as in child. There's Zak, H2134, translated pure, and Zake, H2135, translated clean, cleanse. There's Hamal, H2550, translated pity, and Hamale, H2551, translated mercy, or pity. There's Thabach, H2874, translated slaughter, and Thabache, H2878, translated slaughter. There's Yalal, H3213, translated howl, Yalale, H3215, also translated howl. There's Kashab, H3775, lamb, and Kashabe, H3776, lamb. Now I stopped there, but I could have went 
the entire Obri glyph set or alphabet. And I could have provided you with a lot more examples per glyph than I did. This was quick. This was me just wanting to grab one from each glyph as I went forward through half the alphabet or glyph set. But suddenly, when we go back to Adam, H119 through 24, and to Adam A, H126 through 128, they're nothing alike. One is man, one is a kind, one is a creation whose descendants and progeny we follow throughout the entirety of the Bible. The other is the ground. Now, I know that because it's been translated like this for so long, there is the idea of putting together Adam and the soil. And it's very true that the descendants of Adam, uh, many of them, have been farmers or men of the land, but not all of them. Also, there's going to be other ideas that we've picked up because of the way that Adam is translated, which, again, I believe is incorrect. And those ideas, they just don't hold weight. Because we can see, uh, we can see things that speak against it. We can witness phenomena that speak against it. It's like I went over a few episodes ago. The idea of Adam meaning to show blood in the face. That there's that word. First off, it doesn't have enough glyphs to to put that idea together to show blood in the face. It would probably have to be at least two words. Um, you know, the best you can get out of it is is augmented blood. And in fact, I, I would say the best thing you can get out of it, because of, of all of the uses we can see with the root dem, that it, it's simply alluding to a very strong likeness. Of whom? The Creator. And unfortunately, I've been around enough non-Adamite or non-whites to know that when they're angry or when they're um, embarrassed and they get embarrassed they show blood in their face they just don't show it like white people do now the fact that forms of Adam are used or translated in the sense of red I don't know that, that that actually is alluding to red or not. Those passages, and, and they're not a huge amount of passages, those could simply be referring to having a look such as Adam. And if Adam is a kind and Adam has a certain look to them, then that would follow. So having gone over that, let me move to the next point. The next thing we can see is uh, that in Genesis chapter 1 alone, there are kinds, categorical kinds, that are expressed in their, their simple root form and are also expressed elsewhere in their generalized form with that E at the end. Uh, we see that with oats, the word for tree, which is H6086, it also appears as otse, with that general, generalized or feminized E ending. We see it with ma'arit. Uh, ma'arit is a, a word for specific lights, not just light itself. If it was light itself, it would be aur, A-U-R, or sometimes R, because the U is sometimes dropped. Um, or are, you also see it in, in that form, but ma'aret would be specific um, objects or instances that embody the concept of our light. 
this is what is um, in Genesis 1, uh, 1 16, the, the lights in the heavens, Ma'aret. Um, that also appears as um, the, it's, it's called a feminine plural, UT, which implies that beneath that feminine plural is the generalized E ending. You'll see that later on in the Bible. We see it even from the start with hiya. Now, the, the root of that, I should probably say hiya, because, uh, well, I'm not exactly positive with the H. If the H at the front of the word actually has a softer, breathy sound, and then at the, uh, the middle or the end of the word, if it picks up that more guttural CH sound, should it always have it or not? I'm not sure. Um, but I've started pronouncing it more with a guttural sound in general. So we could have ki or chi for alive or living. Or chia is, is just the generalized term for something alive. Um, without being specific. That's what the e at the end does. Is It, it allows you to express a concept without being too specific. And when we see the atom with the E at the front, which is more specific when you put the E at the, uh, the front because it's uh, essentially it's the Obery way of providing definite article. Then we have a being um, that is very specific, but just Adame is less specific. So we see that with he um, right at the beginning or, or ki or chi. It's just H-Y or H-Y-E for the general. It happens with Ramash. We have Ramashat. Whenever you see the T at the end, the T is oftentimes a signal that that word is being expressed with the generalized ending. The T is put on at the end to uh, signify that it is relating to something else in that statement. So just the fact that we see it expressed with that T at the end should clue us in to the fact that it's probably being expressed with that generalized ending, though it's being linked to something else in the statement. And then we have Bema. And we see Bema, we're mostly going to see as B, you know, B-E-M-E, -E, but we will see it a number of times expressed as just B-E-M. Um, and then... A big one is dag, and I, I went over dag, fish, because we also see it as dege, more generalized. And we see these things in Genesis 1. We know that Genesis 1 is dealing with uh, very specific types and kinds of things, um, sort of broad category, but the fact that we can see... Um, at other places in Scripture, this, these words that are specific kinds in Genesis 1 expressed as a more general term of this kind of thing is telling. And the fact is, we can see that with a lot of other words as well uh, that are not just in Gen Genesis 1. Uh, we can see it with um, Boir, and Boire, that's H1165, and that's translated as beasts or cattle. We can see it with Malak, which is H4397, and Malake, which is H4399, meaning a, um, like a messenger. We can see it in Tsan, the word for flock, uh, H6629, and Tsane generalized term for a flock. Uh, we see it in Kul or Kale, uh, Madin and Madine, which I cover a little bit in my presentation on Midian. So it's all over the place. This isn't a this isn't a fringe theory or something that there's not much uh, behind it to back it up. There is a huge amount of, of biblical evidence to back up the fact that whenever we see a word that has that generalized or feminized E ending, 
connected to a root that it should have a, a very similar yet of course generalized uh, meaning of what the root is Adam Adame yet for some reason when we see Adam we typically see man when we see Adame we typically see ground or earth now one thing that we have to understand when we're looking at this word and its context how it's used is that there are word games being played there are word games being played with the words that are being translated in their in their various ways in the Bible the problem is so if we look at uh, the three main uses of H127 Adame it's used uh, or rendered as as land earth and it's also rendered as ground okay the problem is this when it suits the translator they will for instance let's take the 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 times that it appears as earth when it suits the translator they will present that as the solid ground so that's like the first definition you'll typically get if you put in land or earth or ground about your first um, entry in a dictionary is going to be the solid ground of of um, I guess they would say the solid ground of, of earth or the land of earth because see now if you put in earth one of the definitions you're going to get is for instance the entirety of the earth which if we were looking at it that way that we would have that question answered in Genesis 1 1 in the beginning Aliyim God uh, bara created uh, the heavens Shema'im and the Aretz Aretz now Aretz is actually used very sufficiently in the sense of if we, if we want to consider the um, the dry land part of the creation because the creation is mostly mostly th let's say three parts right we have the the part below and the part above more or less and below we have seas uh, yamim and we have uh, the land Aretz and then above we have uh, Eshemaim, which is the Rakio. Um, Rakio is actually just that gap. The, the gap in which we live and breathe in, the gap which the birds fly in. That's the Rakio. The, the Rakio is, is not the hard, fast boundary, I'm afraid. I'm not. Because we want to know what's true. Everything about the root, Rick, is, is a divide or a separation. It's not specifically the thing that is the waters above. The waters above are in and of themselves the waters above. And we know at least enough about as you go up in height, elevation, it gets desperately, desperately cold. And we don't know how far up those waters in fact are, but it's not unreasonable to just conclude that what we're looking at is ice up there and then we have a very large space the Rikio which was named as Shema'im translated as the heavens but there's just basically three parts and, and we, we can actually the Bible reduces that down even further into simply the Shema'im the heaven which is the is the name of the Rikio and the lower portion the earth which is named Aretz we have our word for the uh, the the non sea portions of this creation that we dwell upon arets we don't in fact need adame and the fact that adame shows up and it's nothing like arets except they both start with an a which is not telling us much of anything it most of the meaning of that word is going to be found in the consonants not the vowels and um 
So there's, there's really no need for that synonym. We have it very well covered in arets. We'll also find that there's just a, a huge amount of passages in which we can find both adame and arets in. And there's truly no need for both of those words. Unless adame was specifically and just the soil of the arets, the land. Let's just say the topsoil. Now, if it were that, again, nothing in that word that would lead us to believe that it's relating to us, that it's topsoil. But we could just go with that, and we could test that, because it can't be all of those things. Okay? But the bottom line is, they've played a lot with words. A lot of the rules that we have concerning English grammar, or, or a lot of our languages of today, the, the thin, meaningless languages that we use today, which are made up of meaningless letters and numbers, and uh, are just really full of uh, rules of expression that are contrived by someone and not us. And, um, and they don't reflect what we see in older languages the uh, the structure of older languages, how they work, and they don't have anywhere near the the consistency that a language that is made up of intelligent or meaningful pictographs or glyphs would have. Because if that symbol means something, then that symbol always means that thing. If that symbol relates to another symbol in a certain specific way, it's always going to relate to that symbol in a, a certain specific way. Now, yes, we can get into abstracts, and there are a lot of times that the Bible is using these, um, these concrete concepts that are formed by the combination of these glyphs, symbols, or pictographs. But that doesn't mean that they can still mean multiple things at the same time. The idea of homonym should be just thrown out the window. So I wanted to start before I, I go through any of these things with the fact that they employ a lot of wordplay. And, and a lot of that wordplay has a lot to do with the use of things like synonyms, homonyms, antonyms, things like that. Which is not something that I found uh, to be present when Obri, the language of the Bible, Hebrew, if you're stuck on Hebrew and you want to call it that, it's not the way that that language behaves. Not in, in any sort of testing or observation uh, that I've, I've ever noticed or recorded. Okay? So just starting with that, we're going to go through a number of passages that we find this word adame in and see how much sense it makes or, or doesn't make if we're going to regard it as soil. Because soil is not land. I mean, even if arets, if they used arets as soil, and when I say soil, yeah, it's not translated as soil in King James. You're not going to find it in Strong's as soil. You'll find it as earth, but they are using it in the sense of soil, and I can show you, <coughs> excuse me, I can show you that, okay? Now, I told you I was not going to go deep into Genesis 2, 5 through 9, and I'm not, because there's so much to it that would have to be unpacked. But I am going to point out some, some problems therein, some issues, so that you can understand that there's a, there's a lot of ground to stand on, not being punny, um, for us to question this use of Adame as, as ground or soil, okay? So in Genesis 2.5, this is right after the verse that I went over a few episodes back, in which we have the ta'uladut, the produce, the products, the happenings of, the children of those seven days of creation. Six work, one rest. And then we go forward. And then we have these uh, four or five verses that are telling us the state or situation of things from that point immediately forward. Okay? Now, in English, 
it's going to, because of the way that these words were manipulated, and in, in my um, pretty well-educated opinion on these matters, I would say a lot of these words are very badly translated, or let's just say uh, greatly altered, in order to achieve this end result. Now, what it says in KJV English, starting at Genesis 2, 5 through 9, it says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth. By the way, that ground is H127, okay? But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground, there's H127 again. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. There's H127 again. Okay, the man is, when it says formed man, that's um, uh, H120, I believe. Yeah, sorry, I, I should be reading this from KJV+. Plus. So that would help make it easier. Um, from So man is in this verse... 120, yeah, so that's that's what usually is translated as man or Adam, depending on how it suited the translator. It says, from the dust of the ground, their ground is H127, Adam A, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then 2.8, we don't see Adam A, but it says, and then the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And then we see Adam A one more time in Genesis 2.9, and out of the ground, there it is, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also is in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right, so when you hear that read in this, in this way, as they've put it together and as they've translated it, it seems like, well, ground works. If you did a word study on H127, you saw it in all its contexts, you'd say, well, it works just fine. But this is when, what I went over in, in episode 7, is that oftentimes you'll find that there are, are rules that are supposed to be rules of grammar. They're supposed to be rules of Hebrew grammar that are broken all the time to make these verses work. There are inconsistencies to make these verses work. Now, I'm only going to go over a few things in these verses to give you an idea of how they have likely been altered so that they can achieve the goal of completely covering up what was actually the state of things and why the Adam, who we see being formed in Genesis 2-7, was formed. And this, of course, is the Adam who, down through his descendants, we see Noah, we see Abraham, we see the formation of the nation of Israel through Jacob and his two wives, two concubines, 12 sons, one daughter. So the first thing is this. All right, now in Genesis 2, 5, when it says, Every plant of the field before it was in the earth, every herb of the field before it grew... For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. There are serious problems with the wording in there. The, the word or the root, ther, appears in two different forms in this verse. In one form, it's being translated as before, and in the other form, it's being translated as rain. We do have problems with it because as we start to look into that root, we can see that it's actually used in very different ways than what we see represented. There are also a number of other words that are used for rain. Um, sometimes when you get to a word, like I, I pointed out, that has sometimes multiple synonyms, you have to wonder if that word being a synonym of other words, or those other words being a synonym of it, are actually necessary. Now, I'm not going to go into Mathir because that right there is a whole study in and of itself. 
What I am going to go into, first off, when we see plant of the field and herb of the field, we have Shade. Now, Shade doesn't necessarily mean a field where crops come up. That Shade actually refers pretty much to land that is occupied by people. And it stands in contrast to Midbar, which is land unoccupied by people. Israel was in the Midbar for 40 years, not the desert, just the Midbar, unoccupied land. All right? One of the problems is the word that's, that is rendered plant is sheikh, uh, sh, y, and h, k, sheikh. And the thing is, when we start looking at that root, we come up with all kinds of we come up with all kinds of words and usage, usages that are nothing like plant. In fact, sheik is only uh, translated as plant four times in all of the Old Testament. The, the other thing is herb. And now, herb is another one that I wouldn't have time to go into. That's osheb, which it's very, very possible that osheb, because of its root, sheb, and that tends to uh, typically be talking about somebody who inhabits or dwells, Sheb or Shub, or to, to go somewhere. It just, Osheb being in that root family, it just doesn't really follow. So there are a lot of very uncomfortable words as far as how they're translated and expressed. But two big things about this verse that stand out besides all of, of those things. One is the fact that, first off, for some reason, we have to have synonyms. We see arets in this verse already two times. Why then do we have to see adame ground? That's the first thing, because arets is also translated in various places as the soil, like we're talking about the dirt, the topsoil that you work on the top of the land, which is not everywhere, by the way. Not all land is covered in topsoil right? There are vast amounts of land that are covered with sand, vast amounts of land that are covered with gravel, all manner of things. It's not always covered with soil, dirt, topsoil, or clay. It varies quite a lot. But anyway, so we have, first off, a problem of a synonym. That could possibly be explained, all right? So that's not the, the argument winner. The other thing we have is the fact that we have this word in here that's translated as till, but it's Strong's H5647. The word in Obri is Obed. Um, Jubru pronounces it Abad. It is O-B-D. Now, what I want to call attention to, and I don't have time to go through all of these occurrences, but I, I can leave that to you because Obed just in H5647, it's real possible that Obed is one of these words that has multiple Strong's entries. Just in H5647 and as according to Esort has 294 entries. I'm just going to go over some of them in just Genesis. Let's keep with just Genesis because we can derive a whole heck of a lot about the meaning of a word, how it's used, just from Genesis, this is this is a big part of the point to Genesis because it's an origins book. So when we see Obed, what we want to do is we want to look at what Obed is in reference to. Because here, if Adame is ground or earth, then we have this word Obed, which is being used here as a verb. It is directly relating to this. So it is the verb and Adame is the object. The thing is, every other time we see Obed in Genesis alone, and I can gar guarantee you if we're seeing it like this in Genesis alone, we're, we're, we're seeing it in other books in the same way. So all we need to do is look at Genesis. What we want to look at is whenever we see Obed, we want to see what its object is, what its relating to. That's very important. In Genesis 15, uh, 13 and 14, 
we can see it used in the context of other people. Um, where it says, uh, there'll be a stranger in a land not theirs, and they shall serve them. The people of this strange land, Obed, they're serving people. Okay, Genesis 25, 23, uh, we see it used in a prophecy about Jacob and Esau. The elder shall serve Obed, the younger. It's used in relation to a person. Genesis 27, 29, um, let's see. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. All right, it's used in context, a person. It's something that's being done to a person because it's a servant. Um, it is someone doing some kind of work or, or service to a person. Genesis 27, 40. Um, and by the sword you shall live and shall serve thy brother. Genesis 29, 15. Um, Therefore serve me for nothing. And this is uh, Laban and Jacob speaking. Genesis 29, 18. Again, it says, um, Jacob loved Rachel, so he served, or I'm sorry, and he said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel. He's speaking to Laban. He is providing service to a person. Um, Genesis 29, 25. Again, we have a lot of passages with Jacob and Laban speaking because Jacob served Laban for 14 years years just for his two daughters, which he was going for one and he got the other. And anyway, so um, he says unto me, did I not serve with you for Rachel? Now Genesis 29, 27, thou shalt serve with me yet seven more years. That's Laban speaking to Jacob. Now we go down to past tense uh, form and we have uh, 12 years they served Kedor Laomer. It's talking about the cities of the plain. So um, Sodom, Gomorrah, um, and Adame, and uh, Zon. So it's speaking of they're serving a person. Genesis 29, 20, back to Jacob and Laban. It says, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel. He served who? A person, Laban. Uh, he went also unto Rachel. He loved also. Uh, he loved Rachel more than Leah. Uh, that's sad. And he served with him yet seven other years. Genesis 30, 26. Give me my wives, my children, for whom I have served you. Serving a person. Thou knowest I have served you. Genesis 31, 6. My power, I have served your father. Genesis 31, 41, uh, I served thee 14 years, speaking to Laban, a person. Okay, so the next time we see Obed appearing in Genesis is right here in this passage, but it's translated as till. Now, Obed is actually translated as till four times. But I want to go over those four times, not in depth. I just want to show you something about those four times. Every time Obed to serve is translated as till instead, we always see it directly in context with Adam. So there's Genesis 2, 5. We see it there to Obed the Adam, and it's translated till the ground. Genesis 3, 23. Um... He sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to Obed, the Adame. And here again, it's translated to till the ground. To Samuel 9, 10. Um, and it is right here. Thy servants shall Obed, the Adame. And it's translated till the land. And then Genesis 27, 11. Now here, oh, that seems like a curveball because Jeremiah 27, 11 says, but the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those will I let remain still in their own land, saith Yahweh, and they shall till it and dwell therein. Oh, but here... Isn't it saying that they're going to serve the land? No, because right before that, 
we see Adame. They're going to Obed the Adame. So then we we see it in a um, we see it in in its past tense just a couple of more times. Okay, so the few more times that Obed is used as till, so you understand that there is an answer for every single one of these times that it's used as tilled. Because if you use the word till, you're of course thinking of breaking up and, and working the soil, right? But as I showed you, when Obed is used in Genesis, just in general, it's always referring to a person or people. And then I showed you till and how that always appears with Adame. Now it also appears in Ezekiel 36, 9. For behold, I am for you and I will turn unto you and ye shall be tilled and, and sown. Well, that's a really terrible translation because those, those two words there, uh, Obed and Zero, they have the suffixes tem at the end of it. And that means them towards somebody else. And uh, just the verse or two before, he's talking about the nations, and he's talking about Israel. So this short statement follows, if it's translated correctly, that they would serve them. Okay? We also see it in Ezekiel 36, 4, tilled. Um, the desolate land shall be tilled. Well, what about this? Because in here, the land, it's not... Adame, it's actually Aretz 776. Well, again, that is a terrible translation. What's actually being said, just from a, a rudimentary look over this real quick, is it is speaking of the Aretz, the land, but the Obed part of it is not specifically concerning the land. It is specifically concerning the people who would be left there for service. It's not talking about specifically Obed as relating to Aretz. It is just badly translated. And that's what they typically have to do. They have to employ mechanisms to make certain concepts seem to stay relatively consistent. Now you have it again as tilleth in Proverbs 12.11. He that tilleth his land? Well, that's not. It's Obed the Adame again. I told you, most of the time you're going to see this when it's it seems to be tilling land. It's Obed the Adame. Obed to provide service. And Adame, what is Adame? So you see it again in Proverbs 28, 19. And it's translated, he that tilleth his land. And again, it's Obed at the Adame. Now we see it in Genesis 4-2, which we'll get to. Again, it is Obed Adame. And again, in Genesis 4-12, Obed Adame. Okay, so if there was any reason to regard Obed as tilling, which is the minority of usages of Obed, it almost always has to, or is in context with this word we're looking at, Adame. And as we saw in all of those passages in Genesis, when we see Obed properly used, it's always talking about people. You're providing service to people, not to inanimate objects. It's always in relationship to people. So when we see it in Genesis uh, 2 and 5, we see it translated, there was not a man to till the ground, or there was no Adam, or Adam would not, Obed, provide service in any way to the Adame. That's what we see there. Now, in Genesis 2, 6, when it says there was a mist from the earth and it watered the whole face of the ground, again, we're looking at a few words that are a little bit dubious. First off, mist, odd. Odd only appears a couple of times, A-D, 
in the whole of the Old Testament, like two times. So good luck trying to do a word study on that if you're simply going to use the words as they appear and are dictated in Strong's. Um, yeah, odd. A lot of the times when, when we actually would see odd, let me just say this. Besides the fact that we see odd appearing a lot in the form of, let's just say, Adam, we do see it a lot in the form of the word adun. You, you put on that un suffix, it's that un suffix, it's almost like a, um, give you the, the best way of, of um, relating that. In a sense, if a word was named something with a un ending, it would be like taking the root and giving you a word that was basically like the, um, almost like the product of the root. Look at, uh, for instance, the name Shemeshun, which is transliterated as Samson. His name was Shemeshun. The Shemesh is son. And it was almost like his parents were naming him something produced from, from the sun, Shemeshun, okay? Now, Adun is translated most of the time as Lord or Master. And it follows pretty well. It's translated as Lord or Master as Adun 335 times, as just Adin 57 times, and Adani, like my Lord, 434 times. So we, we need to reconsider the usage of the word Ad here in Genesis 2, 6. And then when it says that um, it calls it a mist, right? From the Aretz, but we don't know that that's mist. And then it says, and it watered the whole face of the ground. And here we have this shake or shakwe. Again, a very dubious use of it. And it has the kol pani, the adame. And we're going to look at examples of pani and ol pani. Because pani is, is typically translated as face. But we're going to see how face is used. Because... A lot of times we'll we'll just see pani face or opani and it just being used as before. It simply means um, with against right up against. We see it with nation borders that something is opani another country. It's against it, right up against it, signifying a border. Um, so the next odd thing is that in Genesis two seven we have this. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, right? And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Without going too far into that, one of the first problems we have there is that it doesn't say that grammatically. It doesn't say what we would be looking for if it said that grammatically. We would be looking for, um, let me just switch here to the uh, the, the Jubru module. It says, U ye yitzar, Yahweh aliyim at a Adam oper min a Adame. All right, there's a serious problem with the, the structure of this verse. If it was indeed saying that, um, the Lord God, Yahweh aliyim, formed Adam from the dust of the ground, our structure would have to be different. It's saying that Yitzar, which first off, its minority uses are of formed. Its majority uses are something that's more like, um, I don't want to give a negative uh, aspect to the word, but more like something impounded, okay? As opposed to something formed or sculpted. And you can check that. The root is tsar. Yahweh aliyim at at Adam. So it's got that um, it's got that definite article on the front. But 
it should say at uh, Adam Min Opar uh, Adame or uh, Adame Opar if it was the dust of the ground, not uh, Adam Opar. Because if we were translating all of this consistently, that should translate something like, um, I guess if we're going to keep going with formed for Yitzar, it would have to be the Lord God formed uh, the Adam dust, the Adam dust from the Adam A. Not that he formed the Adam. If we were staying consistent, we'd have to say, well, I guess it would say that the Lord God formed the Adam dust from the the Adam A, from the ground. That's a significant problem. That and the fact that Oper, which is translated here and many other places as dust, the thing is, Oper also appears in a different listing, not as dust, but as the young of whatever kind of animal. And in fact, par, the root of it, has everything to do with the fruit or offspring of whatever. It could be trees, or it could be people, or it could be uh, animals. The problem is where the placement is of these words. It doesn't follow, and they refuse to translate it correctly. And then we go on and it says um, what it actually says in Obery is that it would appear that what he did was he... Imp Again, I don't want to use negative sounding words. Imposed upon him. Not just life. Okay, life would be ki or, or I don't know if I should say chi or ki. I'm trying, still trying to figure out what's the best pronunciation. Because if you see it in German, it, it is a ch kind of sound. You see it in like ach, which survived from Obery, ach, uh, and other words. It's just, it's not as comfortable to, to try to do that whole guttural ch, all right? Um, so not just life, like ki, it's kiim. And the only other times we see that are mainly having to do with, for instance, the tree of life. Mostly. That's mostly where we see it in that form. And if we're looking at a verb, it is referring to a verb that is ongoing. He impressed upon him this life ongoing. Not just life, not to be alive, with something dying later, which is what we see everything in the natural world doing. Him, it's different. We have a very different form of this he being used here. So that's another thing. Um, and then, all right, so there's the idea in Genesis 2.9 when we see in English we see it being translated as out of the ground made the Lord God to grow, to grow every tree that's pleasant to sight. And it is H127, Adame, ground. Out of the ground he made to grow. Well, then that really works really well if Adame was soil. Again, though, no. First off, we, we again see this word yitzar, more like um, taking and impounding something that sort of sense to it. Yahweh Aliyim at the Adam. Oh, wait, I'm still in 2-7. Uh, I'm sorry. Yitz, not Yitzar. We're at Yitzama. So when we look at Sama, the word Sama, which appears in Genesis 2-9, it seems to have a, well, right in the neighborhood of 40 occurrences in various portions of the Old Testament. When we look at the two roots of tsama, the first root tsam almost always has to do with fasting, deprivation. 
And then when we look at ma, all of its in, um, occurrences tend to have to do with blotting, erasing, or that kind of thing. So in general, tsama would be typically having more to do with an act of taking away or deprivation. Yitzama, Yahweh Aliyim, the Lord God, from the Adame, all of the oats, and then it describes all of these different things. So I'm pointing that out as well. Now, now that I've pointed out some very real and some some very significant issues just in Genesis 2, uh, 5 through 9. We have that sort of stage set because I think those are probably the verses that were the, the most important ones to radically change. However, we do have Adame appearing um, right after this as well. In, in a few different spots, and we're going to go over that. And from here on out, it's going to be, well, hopefully, a little bit quicker uh, illustration of what the issue of Adame in these contexts actually is. So the first thing we can do is we can jump over to Genesis 3.17. Um, Genesis 3.17 is where we are seeing the effect of what we believe is an account indicating to us that Adam and Eve did something they weren't supposed to do. We're not going to go into the specifics of what they actually did, what the fruit actually was, who Nahash actually was. I would like to point this out, though, that Adam and Eve weren't naked. They were not naked. Unless, in Genesis 3.1, it is saying that Nahash was more naked than any other beast of the field. I don't know how you can be more naked than anybody else. But unless the Nahash was more naked than any other beast of the field, then we have a problem with Adam and Eve being naked. Arum, which is exactly the word being used that they want to translate as naked, is used many other times throughout scriptures as simply wise. Or you could say crafty, subtle, having um, a good intellect. Arum. That's exactly what it says about them in the last verse of Genesis chapter 2. They weren't naked. You think about it for a second, too. I don't care who you are. I'm talking to the guys. I don't care who you are. If you put a guy in a garden and you give him an attractive, because you got to imagine, it's not like she, you know, she wouldn't have been created like morbidly obese or anything, or, or ugly, okay? We're talking about a fit, attractive woman. And they were both naked? I wouldn't be getting anything done, first off. Secondly, has anyone out there ever tried to do any kind of work naked? I actually kind of had to uh, a few times... Let's say when something went wrong while I was in the shower or something and had to do something, you know, stark naked. Yeah, it's not easy and it's not really comfortable. So just on like, you know, an objective sort of rational common sense. Yeah, that seems a little weird, eh? And then you add the fact that a room tends to be translated quite a lot as having high intellect. They weren't naked. But anyways, so Genesis 3.17, this is supposed to be the, the effect of the thing that they did, that they were not supposed to do. 
We see in English, it says, uh, And unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Now, what is actually being said there is arure e adame. Um, and then be oberek, uh, your service. Um, and then otsabun. Now, one thing you have to ask here is why the soil or the ground would be cursed. Now, of course, they are, they're working here to generate an alternative narrative. What we actually see here is, um, so, mamenu, uh, and then we start up with our new thought, arure, uh, adame, be, oberak, okay, um, in your service, um, in, in otsabun, um, to akalne koliyami. Otsabun is another one of those dubious ones. It's it's only translated a couple of times, but we do have obarak um, in your service. This um, aurure, oftentimes translated as curse. The adame. Now, what could just as easily have been translated as that? is that he was either going to be cursed by the Adame in his service to the Adame, um, cursed from the Adame in his service to the Adame. But what they have to work in order to translate from that, they have to work at making the ground being cursed for his sake. So moving forward. Then in Genesis 3.19, we see something similar in the English. The translation reading, In the sweat of thy face you shall eat bread, till you return unto the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust you will return. But in 3.19, first off, the uh, Ba'ozat which is being translated from the sweat. Um, Oz is usually translated as things like strength and power, force and might. Um, apik, your... Usually it's nostrils uh, having to do with anger. Ap. Okay? Um, to akal. It's really unfortunate that, that akal is translated as eat most of the time because everything about the root kal has to do more with um, taking, uh, possessing, which is why oftentimes it is translated as eat. Um, when you eat, you consume. But then it's followed by lahem, which is translated as bread. Um, the only problem is it, it has to do with mixing or blending. And it's, it's oftentimes used as battle. Laham. It's used as battle. Um, beat Laham does not necessarily Bethlehem have to be seen as the house of bread, the house of war. Laham. Just saying. Okay. Until. It's od until Shubak. Now, shub is most often translated as to dwell, um, to, uh, to exist. It's like somebody putting down, um, it's like somebody dwelling somewhere. Um, I can't think of a better word. Uh, living somewhere, dwelling somewhere, okay? And then it goes to towards al. The Adame, which is strange to go towards the soil or earth, key. Well, you could say, well, that's 
him dying. Fine. Ki mamane lu kwahat. Um, basically like taken ki in the matter of oper. We see that word again. Ate, you, um, to you. Which is really strange that ate is used like that because you would expect to see a k at the end of it. I'm just telling you how these words are used. And a lot of them being translated um, inconsistently. All right? And towards al oper tashub. Um, you will dwell. That's the funny thing. It's, it's not the idea of dying or, you know, being put into the ground, we're talking about dwelling or being uh, amongst. It is, it is an act that a living being actually does. Okay, so there's the next time we see Adam A. Genesis 3.19. And then the next time we see it is Genesis 3.23. And we did go over this until, but I'm going to go over it one more time. Genesis 3.23, the English reads, Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to what? Till Obed to serve the Adame from whence he was taken. And he was taken from the Adame. We see that in chapter 2. And we'll get into that. He was taken from amongst the Adame. The Adam, he was called the Adam Opar taken from the Adam A. So he sent him forth from the garden where? To serve the Adam A from whence he was taken. Now if that was just soil, I don't see why he couldn't have done that in the Gan. Gan actually is a word that tends to refer to a place that is special, um, protected. It's probably, it, it, it's, I don't know if it's likely where we get the word garden. I know it's translated as garden, but we do have that root in there, guard, um, which it almost seems that gather would actually be more appropriate than gun. Um, Gan seems to indicate something more special and particular than Gadder. Which Gadder definitely, we, we went over that in the, uh, the words with or without the E ending, like a wall. So anyways, just to throw that in there. And then we see it again in Genesis 4. Now Genesis 4 is telling us about two sons that Adam and Eve had. Two sons that Adam fathered, Cain and Ibel, or Cain and Abel. And we have some verses from that that we definitely want to take a look at. So Genesis chapter 4 is just loaded. It has a number of occurrences of Adam A. And if, if Adam A actually does follow um, the logical progression of understanding roots as we've seen them with that generalized uh, E ending, then it would radically change the way that we understand Genesis 4 as well as radically change the way we understand Genesis 1 through 3. Radically. Okay, so let me just uh, start right here with really what the verses are, and I'm going to give them to you in in English, and then tell you what the uh, Obri slash Jubru says, and what may be wrong with it, and how different it probably is if we look at it in the logical progression of Adam to Adam. All right, so in Genesis 4 2, this is right after it says that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from Yahweh. And then Genesis 4, 2, And she again bare his brother, Ebel, or Abel. 
Because Adam knew his wife, and she bore him two sons. Adam. <sighs> Anyways. It says, And Ebel was a keeper of the sheep. But Keen, and here it is in English, was a what? Tiller of the ground. Those are the words we just covered. Obed? Adame. Now, it... If I could just take one quick second to just, in addition to what we've seen with Obed and how it always has to do with, all through Genesis, every instance we looked at in Genesis, we didn't look at every instance because there were like 250 as, for Obed as a verb. One of the most common uses of Obed as a noun is the Obed of Yahweh. Now, People might get the wrong idea. If you know where I'm going with this, you might get the wrong idea. He's servant. What, like beneath? Not necessarily. See, there's ample evidence, first off in Obery, when we look at uh, Obery roots that begin with the glyph O. Oh. Um... <clears throat> Just see, like, for instance, the word obe, H5645, cloud, thick clouds. Where are clouds usually? Above. Um, og, oh, also it's used sometimes as beam, but I think they're actually referring to clouds. And in carpentry, there are fixtures that you put up in the ceilings of rooms that are oftentimes called clouds. That or beams referring to thick masses overhead. Yeah. O B. There's also Og, O G. Uh, one of the Rapa, not Nephilim, Rapaim, a giant, was named Og, O U G, Og of Bashan. Now, Og is also translated as cakes, which, you know, don't hold me to it, but could have a lot to do with their rising. Um, there is a a bird that's translated uh, twice as a, a swallow, and it is an og-er, og-er. Um, there is, oh geez, words like um, to witness, od. You could look at that in the sense of being an overseeing. Uh, there is o's. Strong, there is, uh, let's see, oath, covered over, arrayed, actually wrapped over, overwrapped, oath. There is oi, O-Y, which is a heap or a mound. Heaps or mounds tend to go upward. Um, there is the word ol, which you'll see a whole lot. Ol is mostly translated as over or against, and so on and so forth. Then there is the um, op, op or oup, op, which is where we most likely get our modern word up from, and it refers to things flying in the air. So I would say that the glyph O has a lot to do with up, over, presiding over, okay? Start with that. So then there's the root bad. We find it the most in H905 as an adjective. It is most translated as besides, alone, apart. Works really well like that. It's, it's cognates, um, back up, at least that idea. So you put those two things together and you get a rendering, I would say, very close to agent, agency. Um, to be agent for is not always to be subservient to. Just want to make that clear real quick and then we'll move forward here with these verses in four. And just real quick, the whole point of bringing that up, too, <clears throat> is all of the Western European whites that you know, are they more prone 
to serve or be served. All right, move on. Okay, so in Genesis 4 2, <clears throat> we've got Cain was an Obed the Adame agent, if you will, agent, servant, whichever, Obed the Adame. And Genesis 4 3, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain, Cain, brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Yahweh. Did he? Or does it say that it was at the cuts, which is kind of the end of a certain amount of days, Uyaba Keen, then came Keen, Mapari, Mapari. The fruit of, the produce of, the Adame to Yahweh. Yeah, and then it, the, the word after that is, um, Manahe, it's usually it's usually translated as offering or, or presented. The whole basis of it, though, is that what Keen brought was the produce of the Adame to offer to Yahweh. Now, I've heard a number of people <clears throat> who have uh, provided commentary on this passage because everybody's always scratching their head like, <sighs> well, I don't understand what it is about uh, Keen's offering that Yahweh didn't like. And then what a lot of people usually say, well, you see, it's because Ebel, he brought animal sacrifice. And all Yahweh wants is animal sacrifice because he wants blood. But that's not true. Go to the law. Go reference the law. People can bring all kinds, and they're encouraged at certain times, to bring various offerings, and we don't know exactly what these are used for. This could have been because there was government then. This could have been what we're seeing was a government already established. And what Ebel brought was of his own possessions and his own work. But Keen brought the produce of the Adame. And Yahweh wasn't pleased with that. Why do you suppose he wouldn't be pleased with that? Would it be because it wasn't Cain's work, Cain's produce? Is that a possibility? <clears throat> Does it sound like a more likely possibility? Then Yahweh just didn't like Cain's offering because it was vegetables and not blood and meat. Now the next time Adame shows up in Genesis 4 is, is Genesis 4.10 in English, and he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. Now that one's interesting, right? Now when we see the wording in it, without even having to um, go through all the wording in there, make sure it's all correctly represented, and I can see just Superficially, there are about three words that certainly need to be looked at for whether or not they are correctly translated. Let's just look at it as it is. Is it that his brother's blood is crying out from the soil, the earth? And remember, mostly this is translated as land or ground. Or could it the sound, because it's actually, the word being used is just the sound, the noise of 
the blood of your brother has cried to me from the adamant. You mean in the sense of him hearing, like he heard the sound of the cry of the unrighteousness of Sodom and Gomorrah? Which way is it supposed to be looked at? Because it can work both ways. Now, in Genesis 4.11 then, Yahweh says to Cain, <clears throat> in English, and now thou art cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's, brother's blood from thy hand. See, Genesis 4.12 is where we get into another, um, another teaching, let's say, of CI that doesn't bear out to be true all the time, like the red in the face. Uh, in 4.12, well, in 4.11, let's say 4.11, not 4.12. In English, and now thou art cursed from the Adame, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. I know I just read that, but one more time. Okay, first off, and then that's where you get in CI things like, and that's why Jews can't farm. Well, I know plenty of Jews that have gardens that raise vegetables and other things that they do fine. The fact is, a lot of them simply don't and haven't for a long time. But there have been small amounts of them here and there living among other people that have. It's one of those straw men that'll get you caught up. As opposed to looking at it as, all right, so here's it in uh, Obri. U o te arur ate men edme asher patsate at pie lukohat at demi ahik. Uh, so, does it say that he's cursed from the soil? Or does it say that from this time he is cursed from the Adam A, which received the blood of his brother, as in he killed his brother among the Adam A? Now it goes on in 412, ki to obed at adame la to sap. Now in English, of course, you know it says, when thou tills the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Does it say that? Does it say ki in this matter to obed when you agent or serve? At the Adam A, la to sup, no more will you be given their strength and you will wander in the land. Then there's Genesis 4.14. And as I said, Adam A is used a great deal in Genesis 4. And it's integral, integral to the story. I can't talk obviously today, integral to the story. This right here should be the verse. I would think this should be one of those verses that acts as the, the scale tipper that really helps to understand. In Genesis 4.14 in English, it says, and this is Cain speaking, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. And that's Adame. And from your face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And now it's Eretz. For some reason, they had to use Adame for earth, and now they have to use Eretz for earth. For some reason, they need these two synonym terms in this verse. Why? I don't know. And then it shall come to pass that all who find me shall slay me. Now, I would hope as we begin to understand what Adame most likely is, 
that these problems that so many people have brought up, because they are problems, where'd Cain get his wife? Well, I don't, I don't think that's a problem, really, because I don't have the first problem with him marrying his sister. There wasn't an issue with that among the offspring of Adam up until a point. At a point, it was just built into the law at that point. Here's how you will reproduce. It never said there was anything morally wrong. For instance, Abraham's wife Sarah was his half-sister. It never made any moral judgments about that. At a certain point in the law, when Israel decided to be uh, in covenant with Yahweh. He built a number of things in the law that were simply an expression of his love towards his people and how they would behave to be a nation who was an expression of his goodness and his decency. Like, for instance, when a man took two wives, they couldn't be sisters. They couldn't be a mother and daughter, because that would cause strife and enmity between them. However, we see that many, many years before this, when Jacob had his two wives, and he also reproduced two sons per with his two wives' handmaids, because those wives understood first off the value of giving your husband sons. Women today don't understand the value of that like they did then. They understood that. So anyways, those were sisters he had as wives. This was not by his choice, of course. But that was built into the law. That's not saying that it was always something wrong with that. However, there's always that question people want to say, Where did Cain get his wife? Well, yeah, she totally could have been his sister. What's wrong with you? There wouldn't have been anything wrong with that. There's so many assumptions that people want to bring to them when they come to the Bible. It's usually people that have decided that it's untrue to begin with, and they, they come up with these assumptions. Anyways, these sorts of things can answer certain questions. One of those questions is, who would Cain have been afraid of? If he was going to go away from everybody else, who was he afraid that was going to find and kill him? Well, this might answer that a little bit, but not completely. We're going to get into probably the more complete answer to that when we look into another word that we first see in Genesis chapter 1. This doesn't entirely answer that. However, what we see here is, is Cain actually saying to Yahweh, he says, in Obri, he says, En... Garshat ati eh yom ma'ol pani e'adame. Now, here's the problem here. And then he says, en ma panik, and from your face, he's speaking to Yahweh, okay, that he's been driven away from, Garshat. Well, I don't know about you, but I find that if I travel from where I live, far away across the country, I'm still on the ground. I find that if I travel from where I'm at across the country, there is likely still soil there. Why would he be saying, today you have driven me from the face of the Adame? He says, ma'olpani, that is before. That has nothing to do with believing about being cursed from. He's saying ma'olpani, that is the physical geographical presence of. You're driving me from before the Adame and from before yourself. So it makes it sound like all of this and all of them were in one geographical location. It doesn't work as well to say you've driven me out from before the soil, because there's more soil way out there wherever it was that he was going. Now that's the last time you're going to see Adam in Genesis 4.14. But understanding it in a different way puts a very different light on the entire affair, I would think. 
Now I'm going to show it to you in a couple of more contexts and then I'm going to address some some generalities that would seem problematic. Again, and hopefully further illustrating why it's just impossible to do these these individualistic word studies that most people do and come to the best answer possible because you're still using you're still using all the tools and all the rules set by the Masoretes, okay? The next time we see it is in Genesis 5.25. Now this is where Nick, or Noah's father, is naming him. And I'll start, I'll just give you the English of it first. It says, and he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord is cursed. And ground, what's uh, translated as ground, that's Adame, okay? But if we look at the uh, the source language, we'll, uh, all right, let's just go ahead and accept the first part of that, fine. But let's get into the second part of it, and from the Otsabun. Now, the, the Otsabun is where they are saying um, concerning, let's see, the toil of our hands, okay? Now, the interesting thing about Otsab and Otsabun is that, oh, see, sometimes it is translated as idols, and sometimes um, sorrow and, and grief. And you guys always, always do this. This will give you a great deal of perspective. Whenever you come up upon these words and you see them translated like, who knows, sorrow? idol, whatever. Go to Blue Letter Bible. Go to Blue Letter Bible and right on the front page, at the very top, you'll see a little uh, search window for words. And it'll say in gray, verse or words. Okay? And then type in one of these words. I'll do it with sorrow. I'm doing it right now in real time. And then what comes up Click on the middle tab that says Lexiconic. And if you want to, no problem, you can select the top bubble that says Exact Match and hit the little arrow key to the right. And you'll get all the words that are translated as sorrow. This will just give you perspective. If, if you're going to be sold before you're sold on the fact that, that that word might actually mean what they say. So let's take Otsubun. They want to say that it's sorrow, but um, abui is translated sorrow, aun is translated sorrow, ania, dab, dabe, dabun, dag, dage, dub, heel, halal, yigul, kab, kom, uh, kos, uh, kos, and kos again, um, magane, Makabe, Maotsebe, Omel, uh, Otseb, Otseb, Otsebun, Otsbat, Tsir, Tsar, Ro, and Tuge. That's me condensing it to just sorrow, not sorrowful and other forms of sorrow, just to give you some perspective. Now, this word otsub, if we go and look at tsab, we can see that tsab is most translated as stood, set, stand. We just saw how the O is oftentimes something over or covering with tsab, uh, stood, set, stand, from otsabun. Yadinu, our hands, from the Adame, giving us rest. He was hoping it would give us rest from the Otsabun of our hands, from the Adame, which, Asher, which, Orare, usually translated as cursed. It would seem like Orare, it, it would seem like it shares this, um, this same root with spit. 
And, um, and every Obery abstract has a, a concrete root. I had to throw that in there because cursed is an abstract. So, Arare Yahweh. We saw that in Genesis chapter 3, where Yahweh says to Adam, the Adame is cursed, or, or would, we weren't sure if they were cursed or would curse you because of what you've done for your sake. The Adame is Arare, cursed. He would give us rest. Now, something you have to keep in mind is, again, the dubious translation of everything in Genesis, the first 11 chapters. And we're not going to get, we're not going to get far at all in the flood account because that's huge. All of the, uh, the wording that I've, I've looked over and thought to myself, well, that's, uh, you know, I don't agree that that has to be worded that way or that means that. The word translated as flood, mabul, it's only found in this context, so we don't have any other way to compare it to anything else. But anyways, how likely is it that this line from Adam that we see from Genesis 2 was the Aliyim. Because Aliyim doesn't always mean the title of Yahweh. It usually means the... I hate to use the word, the gods of, but those at the top. How odd is it to think? Because, I mean, we don't have to just guess. We can see a lot of this in the text and transpiring from the text. If you look at all the peoples of the world today and who it is that really is presiding over the world today, it's not hard to imagine that that's who would be presiding then. And when you understand that there are differences, not all so-called white people are the same. Not all so-called black people are the same. There are differences. And there are very sharp differences between the, the Western European and the Eastern European. Now, the point is this. Would these Adame still be around? That's hard to say. Because we don't know exactly what and how they were. This event that has been translated and sold to us as a flood event, most often as a worldwide flood event, you have to understand something. A worldwide flood event in which only eight souls that we call humans, in which only eight souls survived, is fantastic propaganda, especially amongst our people for this idea that we're all the same and we all came from the same genetic stock. It's fantastic propaganda for that. You know, that's one of the reasons why a guy with the surname Ham, that's an interesting surname, the surname Ham was financed with the people's money. It, it, to the tune of, of m many millions of dollars to build what he and his team said was a replica of Noah's Ark. I'm not entirely convinced of, of many of the particulars of that story. Okay? So throughout those few chapters, you keep seeing this terminology, Olpani the Adame. And what you'll see over and over again 
is you'll see terms in English, things like um, Genesis 6-7, the Lord said, I will destroy man, uh, Adam, whom I've created from the face of the earth, openi the Adame, from before the Adame. So, he will destroy. What do we have there? Mahe. Or, I will erase or remove them from before the Adame. You see, there's not just one way to see this. Secondly, let's talk about Olpani, because some people might say, well, that's over the face of. So, if the Adame was the ground of the soil, because we see in the subsequent next couple of chapters, it talking about this Mabul, or, well, let's see, sometimes we might see a couple of verses where it says, Emmaim were Ol Pani the Adame. So, does that mean these waters were over the face of the soil, or does that mean there were waters before the Adame? Because when we have two countries that are next to each other, as in Shur was next to Mitzram, it says Shur was Ol Pani Mitzram. That's not over Mitzram. That is before. There's a difference. Shur was not on top of Mitzram. It was before Mitzram. And it's used all over the place in reference to people, and it definitely does not mean over them. Abraham's brother uh, was killed, Olpani Terah, his father. He was not killed on top of his father. Okay, um, Ishmael um, died and was buried, uh, Olpani Kol Ahiyu, his brothers. He, he, was, he did not die and was not buried on top of his brothers. Um, things happen, Olpani Sodom, not on top of Sodom, before it. We have to understand these things. Because if we don't, it is quite easy for the Masoretes, their manuscripts, to keep perpetrating all of the changes and alterations which they have imposed upon the text. Now we get to a super interesting verse in Genesis 12, 3. This is Yahweh talking to Abraham, and he's promising him something that he's going to do with him and his seed. And he says to Abraham, um, this is the, the verse where he says, um, well, as it's translated, I'll bless them that bless you and curse him that curse you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's Adame. Okay? That's Adame. Now, in the, uh, in the actual wording of it, it says, uh, Buck call. So, uh, Buck in you. Call every. Mushpachat. Family. And before that, I'm sorry. Una baraku. Bless. Uh, the Adame. Mishpachat. Adame. Families. The Adame. Families of the Adame. The earth. Not Eretz which is the earth, something that's important to note. A few things, actually. This same word, mishpahut, when it's used as families of, we can see it, um, for instance, in, well, let's see, Genesis, or I'm sorry, Exodus 6.15, the mishpahut shemun, the families of Simeon. We can see it in Exodus 6.19, Mishpachat Lui, the families of Levi. Exodus 6.25, the family of the Korhites, and it goes on and on and on. Mishpachat and then the person. And then we come back to Genesis 12.3, and it's not the families 
of persons or personage, the Adame, which makes complete sense. They'd be blessed. Why? As opposed to cursed for Adam's sake. In you, well, they all be all the families of what? The Adame, the earth, the ground? The families of the Adame. In you, they'll be blessed. Genesis 19.25, Yahweh is overthrowing the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. In English, it says he overthrew those cities and all the plain, the Kakur of Yarden. That's the region. All this region, the Kakur, it's, um, it's supposed to give you the idea of a... Um, Mm. like a star, like two hands. Um, I would say it, it most accurately describes a, a drainage plane. Sorry, won't get too far into that. That's part of the book. I've been on that for a long time. And all the inhabitants of the cities, and then the English says at the end there, and that which grew upon the ground, and here we have Adame. What we see again is the word tsama. Now the verb isn't used. It's not used as a verb. It's used as a concept. Utsama, the adame. He's describing all of the people that he overthrew. All through this verse, all the way up to utsama, the adame. So if when we saw this word before, it meant like removed, or deprived when you have major areas, cities, um, settlements, you will also have those who are removed that don't really live in the cities proper, the suburbs. They are living in the outskirts, but they oftentimes deal with those that are living in the more proper areas of settlement. Utsama the Adame. And again, in Genesis 28, 14, when Yahweh is speaking to Jacob, again, we see that he would be a blessing to all Mushpahat, the Adame, and in Zerok, and in your seed. That's interesting. So then we're to believe at the end there, He's saying that you would be a blessing to all of the families of the earth or the land and your seed. Well, if we believe that Adam A is ground, earth, or soil, then we would have to believe that. He's comparing the earth, the families of the ground and the earth, and his seed together when it's so simple to understand the anime, as in Adam made very unspecific, and his seed specific. So the next place that we see Adam used quite a number of times is in the late chapters of Genesis. We'll say specifically Genesis 47. This is where there was a robe uh, translated as famine in the land. And everybody got so desperate that what happened was, I mean, at first, you know, they said, we've given you everything but our Adam, okay? And as the chapter goes on, it said, then Joseph acquired even all the Adam. And in context, again, this is a word where you will also see in the same verse, Aretz. And again, it doesn't seem like it's even necessary to have those two words in the same verse if they are, in fact, synonyms. Now, what one might do is read this and think something like, well, that makes perfect sense. Because it, it reading it as in Adam A is, uh, is ground or land, okay? Although they really need it to be more land here than just plain ground, but we'll just go with, we'll, we'll say it's okay. Those synonyms are indeed equivalent synonyms. Fine. Now, some may read that 
and see Adame as ground or land and say that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. That would be the last thing that they would want to uh, give up to uh, Puroa, Pharaoh. So, of course, it, it follows. It's uh, completely harmonious. But then I would, I would ask, well, first off, what good is land or ownership of land, let's say? What good is ownership and having a lot of land if you don't have people on it? If you don't have people that are producing, making, doing, all of that land is just doesn't really do you any good. You have to have people. Wealth, we always got to look at wealth and and how the people who are secretly ruling the world today, how they look at wealth and what they look at wealth as being. People that try to sell you on this idea that, that real wealth is in gold and silver, if you get past the idea that wealth is, is in notes and pieces of paper and things like that, that try to sell you that true true wealth is in gold and silver. It's not in gold and silver. True wealth is in possessing what has the greatest amount of value. So we have to consider what has the greatest amount of value. And whether we're to believe that the greatest amount of value would be in either land or people. Now, consider this. When Abram came into Canaan, he had no land. And in fact, Abraham and his descendants had no land that they owned. And it, even when they came into Mitzram and, and, and Joseph convinced Peroah to, to carve out a very large piece of land where they could dwell, that was still not their land. So for 400 years, Abraham and his descendants, they did not own any land. They simply moved from place to place and they grazed their animals from place to place as they could in wide tracts of open area and open land. They did not own land. Abraham actually had to purchase land for certain things like for burial purposes. There was an instance uh, in Bar Shabot that he, <clears throat> it looks like from the translation, planted a vineyard which he would have had to have secured that land for himself. But Abraham, so he didn't have any land. He owned no land. But he was considered extremely wealthy. Extremely wealthy and powerful. Why? He owned no land. But we see when he goes to rescue Lot, that he selected nearly 400 Men who were born and raised in his house under his supervision amongst all that he possessed. He selected nearly 400, 300 and some odd men, young men who could fight, who had been trained. You see, Abraham had a great amount of wealth and strength, not because he possessed a a marked out portion of the arets, but because he had people. So when these Mitzri get to the point to where all they had left that they hadn't sold to Proa so that they could eat was their Adame. You have to consider, was that land, was that soil, or was that the people that they possessed because it was simply commonplace to possess people who were your servants. They weren't mistreated. They weren't mistreated like they are today, where we are told that we are free, yet we are, are taxed to death when everything costs too much for us to live in comfort and freedom. They had to take care and provide for those that they 
And maybe some people are uncomfortable with this, but, you know, we have to grow up. Those people they possessed. That was where their value was. Because you can sell off what land you own if, if land ownership was a thing then, like it is today with deeds and that sort of thing. If that were the case, you could have sold off the land that you possessed and simply been paying rent or had a landlord. And if you had many people that were still under your supervision in your house and under your roof, well, we'll say your, your symbolic roof, who were producing, you still had a certain amount of wealth because wealth is not in gold and silver. Wealth is not even in land if you don't have the people to produce it. And you see, that's what Rachel and Leah understood. That's why they gave Jacob their handmaids so he could have more sons because of the wealth in your people. And there's no greater wealth than in your sons and daughters, your children. That is wealth. That is power. So I hope that will give you a further understanding of why that certainly does not have to be land, earth, or soil when we see them holding back. And we see that the one people that didn't have to give up their Adame were the Ken, the priests of Mitzrim. I hope that puts that into more perspective. Now, I could go on with these verses for a really long time. Because uh, Adame is, is found about 225 times in the Old Testament. And one thing that struck me when I started going through and, and looking at the instances of Adam A was for one thing how many verses where it appeared wherein words let's say that were just common anywhere else and translated in a very consistent way oftentimes had to be changed we saw that with Obed servant it appears as as servant most of the time, but in very key passages, they had to change it to till so they could make Adame work as ground or soil. We saw it over and over again with um, the verses in which the situation with Cain and why he was rejected and then him being cast out. Um, we saw it in Mitzrim when we considered what's of more value, land or people. We saw that Obed is always referring to people serving people, not inanimate objects. Um, and we saw the, the dubious wording whenever it suited the Masoretes and the translators to make this, uh, this figure of speech, Olpani, instead of before, which is what's common when we see the Ten Commandments. And Yahweh says, you will have no lesser aliyim, Olpani, before me, before my face, before me, not on top of, not over, as in a flood of waters over the ground, as in other things over the ground, when they want to make Adame seem more like ground, land, or earth, they just change it and make its aspect one thing. And when, for instance, in the Ten Commandments, it is obviously before, then they change it to what it obviously is. When describing borders and one country or land is before another country or land, they use it in its obvious sense. Just the fact that they have to change things so much to make a word that appears based on all of the evidence to be obviously related to Adam 
the simple fact that they have to change it so often to make it keep appearing as ground earth land is telling. The fact that they have to use it so often in verses with Aretz, which is the obvious ground, land, or earth, but still maintain that it's ground, land, or earth, is telling. And one other thing, because I can't go, as, as I said, I can't go through all of these verses, and this is much bigger than just this idea that Adame is more solidly connected to Adam um, that creature which Yahweh made closest to his image. Because we have other we have other terms in Genesis 1 to discuss. This isn't the end all be all. This is a term. This is illustrative of how much the text has been altered and how much it has likely been altered. We have to cover other things. But I'll give you one other thing for those who are are sort of budding and want to get into this themselves lest you come by various verses and you get disheartened because you say, well, that looks, that looks so obvious, but it's not. I'll give you another one. Ol. Now, we went over ol pani. Pani usually being like face of, and that being translated before, and it works beautifully when it's before something. We can also look at ol, because ol often appears with Adame. And I want you to keep something in mind. When they want Adame to seem like ground, they will translate ol as over, for the most part. But out of all of the passages in which ol, H5921, occurs, it occurs mostly, as in it is rendered or translated mostly, against. And if you start looking at it in context with all kinds of things and peoples, you will see that it's very common, for one thing, to find things like one people was dwelling all another people against. They were up against one another. All is translated 541 times as against, and then 414 times as over. On, 355 times, therefore, I kid you not, therefore, 132 times, because, 93 times, concerning, 84 times, at, 81 times, off, yes, off, 70 times, above, 69 times, before, 54 times, into, 50 times, there, there, for, 48 times, according, 43 times, wherefore, 30 times, towards, 29 times, beside, 21 times, next, 20 times, whereon, 19 times, after, 18 times, about, 12 times, therein, 9 times, under, 9 times, among, 8 times, thereto, 8 times, within, 8 times, thereupon, 7 times, then, 6 times, comfortably, 5 times, through, 5 times, steward, four times, whom four times, charge three times, forward three times, sake three times, and I'm only halfway there. Wither three times, why three times, beyond two times, consider two times, fifty-two, fit, fitly <laughs> two times, kindly two times, oversight two times, reason two times, regard two times, round two times, sake two times, thereby two times, therewith two times, throughout two times, touching two times, upside two times, where two times, whithersoever two times, besides one times, between one time, captain one time, captain one time, yes, charged one time, employed one time, between one time, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, evident one time, falsely one time, for as much one time, governor one time, handle one time, have one time, hear one time, life one time, must one time, near one time, patrimony one time, patrimony one time, presence one time, ruler one time, served one time, these one time, thus one time, where one time, when one time, ye one time. Now, 
if you're perfectly happy with the way the Bible is translated, and even in the face of of all of even just the atheists, and maybe I can make my point really sink into home better this way. The people who are going around claiming to be the people of this book, the frauds, these are the very same people who are behind the scenes with the hidden hand, doing everything they can to destroy our faith in this book and our history. Now, given the fact that this is a serious battle, and they mean business, and they have all the resources that we don't to wage their campaign and their war against us. A war of genocide, power, control. What do you want? What do you want? Do you want to believe in lies that make you feel better about yourself? Or do you want to believe in things that aren't correct just because they work? You can come up with a lot of theories that work and they may not be correct. They may seem to work. Or do you want the truth, the facts? Whether we understand them entirely or not right now is not the point. It's, it's like that series I started, Let's Consider Luke. What do you want? Do you want to be one of those people that adheres to the four Gospels, even if they are in stark contradiction to one another? Or do you want to know exactly how they are in stark contradiction to one another, so that we can best find the answer to why that is. Do you want to cling to Paul, whether or not his teachings contradict both Jesus, so-called, and the rest of Scripture? Or do we want to understand why it is a number of his teaching contradicts uh, Jesus, the authority of the apostles that Jesus handpicked, and the rest of Scripture's? Do we want to understand these things? Are we willing to, to look into and cope with ideas that maybe we don't have all of the answers to? But we at least can clearly see that the answers we've been given don't add up. Now, I don't remember who it was that said this. I'm sorry. But they said the sign of an intelligent man is one who can hold two seemingly contradictory thoughts in his mind simultaneously without going crazy. You may not have the absolute answers to everything immediately. But the important thing is, because I haven't I don't have all the answers for everything. I'm just working towards. That's the important thing. That's the goal we're working towards. We have to look at all the evidence and consider all of it objectively. Oftentimes, we have to consider all of it in a very detached way. It often requires us letting go of a number of preconceived notions we had that either comforted us if we're the all-or-nothing type, where everything about the Bible, including the modern translations, have to be absolutely inspired, true, and inerrant, or it's none of it's true. We have to stop thinking like that. It's, it's simply not good, rational processes of, of, of thinking and understanding and figuring things out. What I'm trying to offer you here are ideas 
that are beyond what we've been presented. They are not simply ideas for the sake of offering you concepts, theories, or ideas that are new or different or go against everything else so that somehow I'm original or even an, an enigma. I don't need that, don't require it, don't particularly want that. I would rather be in and live in a righteous world, a righteous government governed by our Creator, the truth, than to have to be somebody who defines how special they are by unique concepts that they can contrive. I don't want that. I'm trying to show you these things don't add up. And the reason that maybe many people before this haven't seen this is because so many of us are still working with the tools and within the environment that our enemies have contrived. And the only way we're going to get our minds from outside of that prison is to be willing to give up a number of the preconceived notions that we have, and to look at things in an objective, detached, rational way. So with that, I'm going to wrap this one, and I'm going to be back with you very soon, and we're going to talk about a few other terms that we see first appearing in Genesis 1 that play a very important and integral role in all the rest of Scripture, and as I see it, to this day. So with that, bid you farewell, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.